With over 35 years of ministry, Mount Zion Church is located in Clarkston, Michigan. You may have seen us while driving an I-75 just north of Great Lakes Crossing. We invite you today to join us as we go inside to hear a fresh and relevant word in this new day. Mount Zion, helping you experience the best life. In John, it says, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not because he cared for the poor, because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. Wow, Jesus had all this wisdom, and he puts Judas Iscariot in charge of the money. How many know that didn't make any sense? <laughs> But how many you know God's wisdom is not our wisdom? Because sometimes the Lord's like, okay, this is what they want to do, so we're going to let them do it. He feigns he has this concern for the poor because he wants to kind of be real frugal with the budget of the money that they have so he can take it and use it for himself. So this is the kind of person that he was, and uh, he was a thief, and he was after the Likeness of the father of thieves, if you would, because why? He had opened up his heart to the wrong thing, and of course, because of that, the enemy was able to use him. Now, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4, this I say, therefore, and testifies in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the vanity, futility, emptiness of their thinking. In other words, they have a mind that doesn't lead them anywhere where God wants us to give us his mind that will certainly take us somewhere. It says, the people who don't know the Lord have their understanding darkened. Why? Because they're alienated from the life of God. How many know when you receive Jesus Christ, you have now been reconciled to the life of God? How many here tonight glad you have the life of God? Amen? It's very important for us to know that. So not only do we have the life of God and those who don't are certainly walking still in death it also speaks about their ignorance and also the blindness of their heart. What are they ignorant of? They're ignorant of God's ways. They ignore his ways. They choose to do their own thing. And because of that, they have blindness of heart. And I've referenced this scripture quite frequently in, in these days because I believe it's such an important scripture to see not only why the people in the world act the way they do, but how we are able to not respond in that way. And because of their ignorance, there's a blindness of heart. Why? Also because their past feeling. They harden themselves to the sensitivity that God puts in each and every one of us. So that means that if we want to have a heart that's not blind, like Judas, we don't want to open up ourselves to the wrong things, do we? We want to make sure we're in touch with the life of God. We don't want to be ignorant of God's word. And so how do we judge our heart? How do we keep ourselves on the right course? Obviously, by taking heed according to his word. And then also, we have the Holy Spirit. How many glad for the Holy Spirit? Amen. The Holy Spirit comes in and it helps us feel or sense God but it's not just a feeling or a sense or something that be uh, experienced as an emotion. It's our opportunity also to be very aware of God. Now, the Bible says here, don't walk the way the rest of the Gentiles walk. That means you can be a born-again Christian. You can be a person who's tapped into the life source of God. But if you're ignoring the word of God, ignorant of God's ways, and you just choose not to know about these things, you can still walk the way the Gentiles walk. If you're not sensitive to allowing your heart to be touched by God, then what happens is you have blindness of heart. Now, all of this is the opposite of God's wisdom. How many want to keep yourself so you're not like Judas? Amen. Now, I would say that that's not common, obviously. It was one out of the 12. And people sometimes live in condemnation. They go, oh, no, do I have the right heart? Do I have the wrong heart? If you want to have the right heart, you'll have the right heart. Amen. It's a choice we make. 
And so I don't ever live in fear. Oh no, am I going to make a mistake? Am I opening up my life to the devil when my heart is to do what God wants me to do and I'm keeping myself sensitive to the Holy Spirit? But it is important to recognize how we have to keep our heart so that we're not blind and we're open to both the Word and the Spirit always so we can fulfill the purposes of God. Now, having said that, I want to point out these three scriptures here in Luke chapter 22 that was the result of the blindness of heart. The disciples were disciples of Jesus Christ. They had the life of God. They had seen miracles, signs, and wonders. They had experienced them, and they were even commissioned by Jesus Christ, and they had also healed the sick, and they had also cast out demons. I mean, they had a wonderful opportunity to experience all the things of God and they had such a relationship with Jesus Christ that he loved them so much it'd be like him saying you know what I'm going to be leaving my purpose here on earth is that I will be crucified for the sins of the world I, I, I've been to the garden of Gethsemane and I talked to my father and he has told me that there's no other choice for me this is what I want to do and so you you ones that I love I, I want to have a Thanksgiving dinner with you I want us to just have our last moments together now of course the first thing he did is he tells them there's a betrayer in their midst now if you were at a Thanksgiving dinner with Jesus Christ Passover and if he told you he was going to be dying on the cross and this was your last meal, how many know you would think that you would be very Jesus-centered in that meeting? Come on. How many of you would be like, oh, I'm so glad he decided he was going to have dinner with me. This is such an awesome thing. We're having Passover for the Christ before he becomes the Passover lamb. Instead, what they do is Jesus announces who's going to betray him. And what are the first thing they're going to do is they're all questioned among themselves, which of them it was who would do this thing? How many know they got off track right away? Rather than the wonderful spiritual experience it should have been and, and, and appreciating what Christ had done and keeping themselves focused on the direction, they've heard there's going to be a problem, so all they want to know is who's going to cause this problem. It's not going to be me. It's probably going to be you. Well, I don't know about this. How many you know that's just like us? He said, somebody at this table is going to betray me. <laughs> not me. I'm not going to do that. Why, I've been serving the Lord, and I'm this, and I'm that, you know, and, and, and so that was the first discussion, and then immediately they go to the next discussion, because as they're deciding who was the guilty and who wasn't, then they started having to brag about themselves, because then they start talking about which one of them should be considered the greatest. I don't know about you, but if I'm Jesus about this time, I get a little discouraged about my dinner guests. I'm like, uh, knock, knock, anybody know I'm going to be dead in a few days? And you're all wondering who's going to take my place. Come on, that'd be my, like me having a step beating and say, I'm going to die in three days. Instead of everybody crying, they'd be saying, who's going to take your place? Come on. <laughs> they'd be like, are you going to miss me? You can at least fight after the funeral. <laughs> Come on. Mom and dad's passing away. What, well, who gets what? That, that's basically what's happening here. here. Here they're at the Thanksgiving dinner, the very last one. They're the chosen guests. They're the ones that are much beloved. They're the ones who have this wonderful opportunity, and now they want to just decide which one of them is the greatest. Well, Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. See, I don't think that Peter was involved in the debate in verse 24 because he knew he was the greatest. Come on, I mean, if you know you're the greatest, you don't have to get in a... <laughs> He's over here talking to Jesus up. Why, those guys are having this discussion. Hey, we know who it is, don't we, Jesus? <laughs> Lord, you know I'm ready to go with you both to prison and also to death. Oh, Peter, you're so wonderful. <laughs> now, who was Peter? Now, in all actuality, Peter would be the one on the day of Pentecost who would be standing out among the crowd of people, and he would be the one who would be the leader who would begin to preach the first sermon after the, the Holy Spirit had been given. So really, I want you to understand something. 
Peter really had a destiny that was quite awesome. But there was going to be a little bit of a journey he would have to take in the meantime, right? Jesus said, Simon, Simon. Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother. And this is when he said, Lord, Lord, I I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And he said, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. Isn't that a horrible thought to think as Peter, that you were like the guy, the one who could just about do anything. You're willing to die. You're willing to do any of these things. And, and Jesus is telling him, hey, before morning comes, before the alarm goes off, you will have denied three times you even knew me. And on the third time, it's going to be a young lady that's going to claim you're one of my disciples, and you're going to cuss her out, talking about losing your sanctification, Peter. <laughs> Satan has asked for you. Now, in this case, Satan couldn't just go in there and take over Peter's heart. Peter was one of his. And so we understand from the scriptures that uh, he didn't have that authority over Peter. But Jesus understood in this case, Jesus understood that Peter needed to go through a process. And that when he was done with the process, he would be that person that he was always intended to be. And he said, now when you return, in other words, you're going to fall away even. Isn't that awful? But when you return, you're going to be a source of strength to your brother. Now, I suppose from my reading of this story that when Peter came back, he didn't feel like he would be the strength of everybody else. Because he used to feel that way because he just had that natural disposition. But in the process of that, God wanted to process him to prepare him for his destiny. Now, this is so important for us to understand, church, because I really believe with all my heart there's a lot of people in the body of Christ who've been in process. And I'm not just talking about in our local church. I believe this has a, a, been a season that's been upon the nation as God's getting ready to prepare that next group of people, that next generation that's going to rise. I believe with all my heart we're moving into the greatest move of God the world has ever known. Anybody ready to see God do something awesome? And I also believe with all my heart that there's a people that are being prepared in all the nations of the earth, but I'm focusing, of course, here at Mount Zion and those that are here tonight to say to you, you've been in process. You might be like Peter. You might went through a process that made you so disappointed in yourself that you would never believe you could come back, go back, and take your place that God had for you. Because the natural side of it was taken away. But now something better would be there, and that would be the work of God. This scripture has been upon my heart for a couple of days now. It says in Hebrews 12, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and we just discussed what he went through, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, of course, we understand sin's a problem, just like sin was a problem for Judas Iscariot. And, of course, we need to lay aside sin. But the, the part of the scripture that the Lord was speaking to me is, and every weight. You see, I want to point out something about Peter. Peter, you know, he had this grandiose idea about himself, but he actually was called to be a leader. He actually was called to be somebody who would stand up. It's just that the process to making that in the spirit had not yet been accomplished. And so there was something that he had to go through. And so I want you to understand that for Peter, it wasn't so much sin that was the issue. The weight he carried was the weight of his personality, his temperament. 
You see, God who creates us, creates us with a certain temperament, certain natural things that are absolutely a part of what he's planned because he called us and formed us in him before the foundation of the world. How many know you might not like yourself, but God likes you? Just like Pastor Dan was saying, the Bible says that we were all fearfully and wonderfully made. When our substance was not yet known, when we were in the womb of our mother, the Bible says that God began to weave the fabric of who we are. And we have to understand that sometimes our great strength can also be our great liability, but sometimes in the process of that recognition, we realize that God will complete his process, but that which has begun in the spirit is going to be manifested in the end in what was of the flesh in the spirit and yet for that to happen there has to be this process at work but having said that I think it's so important for us to understand that sometimes the weight that holds us back is things about our personality about our temperament where we resist what God wants us to do and in that case what could have been something very good actually becomes a weight that holds us back from running the race if you're running a race, the last thing you want to do is put weights on, amen? A lot of times we carry weights, don't we? What are those weights? Weights are things that can hinder you from running. You see, a couple weeks ago I read the scripture and every week I, I know God's been guiding me and I've been sharing it with you in Habakkuk. It says, write the vision and make it plain that he may run who reads it. I believe this is a time to start running. In order for us to run, we got to throw off the weights. And again, like I said, sometimes those weights are natural parts of our temperament that God will certainly use but can be contrary to what he is trying to accomplish at this point in time in our life. I know for my own self, when I was just a kid, I always had a natural uh, ability for reading. When we were in grade school, they used to have these things, I think they're called SRA readers, where you would read things and you'd try to get through them, answer questions, move to the next level, move to the next level. I was always way ahead of our class because I was always a fast reader, always had a real uh, good comprehension skill in that, and, and with that, I've always had a good memory. And with that, I also have a very logical process of thinking that God has used it for his purposes. But sometimes logical thinking can definitely get in the way of what God has for us to do. Amen? So sometimes what, what, again, like I said, can be something that can be very valuable and its purpose can be a weight if it's pulling you in the opposite direction of what God is trying to accomplish. Or like with Peter, it's making you stand out and think, more highly of yourself than you ought to think, whatever, however you want to look at it, however God would relate that to you. But if there's something that's weighing you down from running the race right now, it's time to lay it aside. And the thing that I want to emphasize, and not just my example, but anything, because sometimes we only think in terms of what will hold us back are sins. And, and, and as Christians, we, God doesn't want us to be sin conscious. He wants us to be God conscious. And then he wants us to realize in looking at ourselves, well, what is it that there's about me that's not necessarily bad, but it becomes a weight. It holds me down from the abandonment to the purpose that God has for me. And then it goes on to say, and let us run with endurance the race that is what? Read that part with me. You see, what race does God want you in? The one that's set before you. We have a tendency to think, well, oh, if I just get, get in another race. Come on. Get me to another place, get me in another marriage, get me into another job, get me another vocation. We're, we're always thinking we got to change our race if we would. And people often do that. And so many people miss out on what God has for them because they don't run the race with endurance. You see, when Peter had denied three times that he knew Jesus, and when it seemed like he was the biggest disappointment, it would have been so easy for him to say, you know what? I just must not be cut out for this Jesus stuff. He might have said, you know what? I thought I was a leader. I'm not a leader. He could have looked at himself in so many different ways and just said, you know, I just must be in the wrong race. Sometimes people convince themselves they're not 
suited to be a Christian or sometimes they just say, well, you know, I'm never gonna be a great Christian or I'm never gonna be a spiritual person. And you get these mindsets sometimes that, well, that's just not possible or like Peter, you made a mistake and you say, well, that's the end of the road. When God has you in process, you gotta understand, like I said, he's both the author and what? The finisher of our faith. And so we have to realize that that which he has set before us is what we have to keep walking in. For God has something set before us. And I've been sharing with you how the Lord has given me a, a word. And some of those words go all the way back to the 70s. And I have a confidence when God speaks to me, I'm going to run with endurance the race. I don't care how many years it takes. Matter of fact, the more years it takes, the longer I'm going to be around here. So, you know, that's not all bad. And uh, so you just make the decision, Lord, I'm going to stay the course. I'm going to put my trust in you, and I'm going to know we're going to win this race together. God has anointed Pastor Lauren to reach the church with a fresh message for this day. If you would like further information, we also invite you to visit us on the web at mountzion.org where you can hear more of Pastor Lauren's messages and find out about our ministries. If you're visiting the Metro Detroit area, we invite you to worship with us at Mount Zion Church. Thanks again for watching.